If you like these videos and you want to see them a day before they go up on YouTube, head over to Library. It's an awesome decentralized alternative to YouTube, and I absolutely love it. Hey everybody, it's your friend and your guy and your favorite Firefox boy, Gardner. Sorry, I'm not into that furry stuff. Is this the biggest vulnerability that we've ever seen? Well, no, because it could be worse, but this is pretty bad. So before we get talking about boot hole, we need to establish a few things. Now, I'm not going to assume for a second that everyone watching this video knows what Grub2 is or what a buffer overflow exploit is. So we'll talk about those first. If you want to just skip to the boot hole section, there's going to be a link down below. What is Grub2? Let's talk about that first. To put it in layman's terms, Grub2 is pretty much the most popular bootloader in the world. What is a bootloader, you might ask? It's the thing that loads all the firmware for your system and gets everything ready for your operating system. It loads the operating system's files and then it transfers control of the system from the bootloader to the operating system. Grub2, being the most popular, is used basically by every Linux distribution out there, but it's also commonly used to load Windows, Mac OS, and uh, most of the BSDs. It's not only used on laptops and desktops, but also servers and workstations and even network appliances. Things like IoT devices or specialized in, like industry specific things for, for healthcare, for education, industrial and financial stuff. For basically, if it's a computer and it's not running Windows stock, it's probably got Grub on it. <laughs> so now that we know what Grub2 is, let's talk about buffer overflows. I, I think they're actually relatively easy to understand. Um, let's say that someone offers you some lemonade. Uh, you hold out a glass that holds exactly one cup and they pour two cups worth of lemonade into your glass. Uh, now you have <laughs> lemonade in your glass, but you also have it on the counter, on the floor, uh, all over the place. Uh, when it comes to computers though, computers don't really have like a counter or a glass or a floor. Instead, they have uh, just a series of zeros and ones in memory. So now let's imagine that you have two programs running side by side in memory. Uh, let's say that program one suffers a buffer overflow and whatever the data was that caused the overflow could theoretically spill over into program two and overwrite parts of that program. So this could cause simple glitches, it could cause erratic and unstable behavior, or it could cause your whole system to crash. I mean, it's rather unpredictable when it comes to a buffer overflow. But this can be particularly dangerous if program two has administrative privileges. And this can be even more disastrous if uh, the exploit was designed to take advantage and overwrite specific parts of program two to elevate privilege to execute code arbitrarily. Some buffer overflow exploits can actually be crafted specifically to take advantage of certain programs or other parts of memory, overwriting places that uh, are known to be executable and then allowing what's called arbitrary code execution. All right, so now we're armed with knowledge. Let's talk about boot hole. Uh, you might have surmised that boot hole has something to do with buffer overflows in Grub2, and you'd be exactly right with your intuition there. Grub2 works by loading an external configuration file called grub.cfg. Most open source programs actually load and parse external text files that contain uh, configuration data. Uh, so this is nothing new or weird or unique. I just realized the whole time I've been recording with Audacity running in the background. That's cool. All right, fixed. Now, boot.cfg happens to live in the boot partition. And if you know anything about Linux, you'll know that you'll actually need elevated privileges in order to edit boot or grub.cfg. But if the attacker can somehow manage to edit that file and insert their malicious data into it, they're actually going to be able to compl gain complete unfettered access to the machine. Once the malicious data is in the config file, all that needs to happen is a reboot to take place. It will load the, the malicious grub.cfg file and that's where the dark magic happens. Grub itself doesn't actually parse its own configuration file. It relies on a third party library called Flex. And, and that's a good thing. We want this kind of stuff to happen. And Flex actually has a check to make sure that a data in the config file isn't too long to actually cause an overflow. The interesting thing here is that Flex actually detected that this string was too long and throws an error, a fatal error, back to Grub. It assumes that Grub will see the fatal error and then halt execution. But Grub doesn't do that. Grub sees the error, 
prints the error to the console, and then returns execution back to Flex. And needless to say, that's not how Flex intended uh, fatal errors to be handled. So once the fatal error is thrown, uh, and Grub returns execution back to Flex, Flex doesn't have any idea that a fatal error just happened and happily takes that data, that data that's too large to fit in the buffer and slaps it right into the buffer. Uh, that's bad news bears. That's what they call a buffer overflow. And if the data is crafted in a way uh, that allows the attacker to gain access to the system, well then access gained at that point. Now you might be saying, I've got secure boot enabled, so surely I shouldn't be worried about this, but actually you'd be wrong. Uh, this, this exploit actually works even with secure boot enabled. What's more is that if you're not diligent about upgrading your system's uh, firmware, then you could still be vulnerable to this attack years down the road, even after Grub2 has been updated on your system. This is a matter of secure boot signing. This is, this is scary stuff. And that all assumes that your hardware vendor is actually going to push an update for your hardware, which might not happen. Quote, all signed versions of Grub2 that read commands from an external Grub CFG file are vulnerable, affecting every Linux distribution. To date, more than 80 shims are known to be affected. In addition to Linux systems, any system that uses secure boot with the standard Microsoft UEFICA is vulnerable to this issue. As a result, we believe that the majority of modern systems in use today, including servers and workstations, laptops and desktops, and a large number of Linux-based IoT and OT systems are potentially affected by these vulnerabilities. Additionally, any hardware root of trust mechanism that rely on UEFI secure boot could be bypassed as well. So the question is, what's next? What can you do about this? Well, there are a few fixes that are already being pushed in distributions, but uh, word has it that some of them are causing the systems to not boot at all. Uh, I would hold off upgrading just yet, uh, since the attackers need root privileges in order to actually initiate this attack, you should be good. So just hold off for a minute and let your distro uh, push a new Grub2 shim uh, update. But the thing is, this is actually kind of a big deal. And this is gonna require a lot of work from many different sources uh, in order for this to be fully rectified. The first thing that has to happen is an upgrade to Grub2 that prevents this exploit from happening. That's already being done. I think that's already done at this point. So number two, what we're waiting for is uh, software vendors who rely on Grub2, to they have to push an upgrade to Grub2. But not just to their bootloaders and all the systems that have that installed, but also their installer systems as well. These in, the installer systems are going to have to have this new version of Grub2 uh, integrated into them. And number three, before these software updates can actually be pushed to people who have Secure Boot enabled, Microsoft is going to have to sign them, uh, cryptographically secure them, and say yes, this is this is okay. This can be done. Number four, all affected devices are going to have to have their software updated, including recovery media. And the fifth thing that needs to be done to secure this completely is every device out there has to be manually updated to, to invalidate the secure boot <laughs> certificates of these affected systems. This is a lot of work. It's a big deal and it's a massive undertaking. Um, but I want to know what you think. Are you in the IT industry? How, do you guys have a plan yet on how you're going to actually address this problem with your, with the systems that you manage? Let me know down below. If you're not in the IT industry, if you're just an enthusiast, do you are you worried about this? Are you going to be addressing it on your own systems? Let me know. I want to thank all 111 patrons over on Patreon, including Augustus St. Clair. Uh, Augustus, my dude, you are truly appreciated. If you believe in the work that I do and you want to help this show out, you can support the show over on Patreon. There's a link down below. You can also support the show on LibrePay if you're so inclined. Uh, it's all welcome. It's all really appreciated. Well, I guess that's going to do it. If you like this video, make sure you hit that like button, hit that share button. That really helps the show out. You can also uh, hit subscribe if you want to see more from me. Uh, pick up a t-shirt if you're so inclined. I, I do some designs. I didn't do this one. Um, anyway, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one and have a blessed day.